So part three, street fighting mathematics. So uh, this title I actually stole from Sancho and Mahajan. He's forgot a book called Street Fighting Mathematics. And I don't necessarily like it because, you know, you should like make love, not war. It's a little violent, but it conveys like an essential attitude for doing math research that I hope to convey, um, which is a bit of a difference between like how you do, like how you solve your homework problems when you're an undergrad versus like how you do like new research to solve open problems. And it conveys the idea that like, you know, if it's an open problem and you're going to be the first person to prove this theorem, then you can do whatever you can do to solve that problem. There are no rules, you know, just solve your math problem. So let me try to explain what I mean by this. So, you know, often you have a math problem and like there's a parameter n, you're like, how do I solve this? And you're like, well, of course the good advice, as you I'm sure know, is like try n equals one and n equals two, n equals three. And then maybe you get some answers like one, two, five, twenty, 125. How do you find the next number in this sequence? You do not use your brain. Yes, thank you. What is your name? Isaac, yes. There's a website for this, okay? It's the online encyclopedia of integer sequences. Oh, yeah, yes. You just type the numbers into it and it tells you the answer. And that's great, okay? You saved yourself so much time. You've got other, yeah, I mean, this is just part of the way to solving your math research problem, right? So do not waste time like trying to figure out that it's the partial sums of the double factorials or whatever. Um, so just do that, okay? Uh, or let's say you're reading a paper and somebody mentions the Sterling numbers of the second kind. Do you know what those are? Do you know the formula for that? You do? What are, what are they? Oh, wow, that's for it. I do not know what they are, but of course, oh, I spoiled it. Of course, you guys, you, you definitely all know this one, right? You do not, don't just sit there puzzled. Go to Wikipedia. Wikipedia is so amazing for math. It's like, math is like one of the things that Wikipedia does best. Actually, TCS itself as a subfield of math is not so great on Wikipedia, but for like pure math stuff, oh man, it's unbeatable. So this is the great uh, delight of our era that we live in. You can just find out what the sterling numbers of the second kind, whatever the heck those are, in an instant. So. Do it, you know, have some curiosity and just look it up. Uh, okay. Does anybody recognize this number? I'd be very impressed. Yes? I think it's pi by eight. Oh, I think it's pi by eight. What is your name? Keith Rupp. Keith Rupp. Is it eight times that? Uh, maybe. No. No. Uh, but it's something like that. Actually, this is based on a true story. Uh, when I was a grad student, I had this office mate and friend uh, called John Feldman, and he's doing some research in coding theory, and he was writing some code, the other kind of code, to like compute something that was the key to his problem, and like the computation returned this number. And there's a website you can look it up. It's basically what Keitra was doing, being the inverse symbolic calculator. So you can go to this website and plug in this number, and it'll be like I think it's best k one comma one or Bessel k 1 comma 1. And of course, then you're like, what is the Bessel k function? <laughs> but we already did this one. You look it up on Wikipedia. Okay, and so this is what you, know, you do, and then you learn some new math, and you um, pretend like you already knew it when you write the paper. <laughs> uh, so I can, in fact, illustrate this story. Uh, there's this uh, great TCS researcher, Ryan Williams, some uh, place on the East Coast. MIT. He was a PhD student here, and uh, I was lucky enough to read a draft of his thesis as he was writing it before he finished it, and it proved a lot of cool things, and one of the cool things it proved, maybe its number one theorem was this theorem. It's not really important to know what this theorem is. He's a complexity researcher, um, but it's going to illustrate a point. He proved that any algorithm for solving the SAT problem using sublinear space needs to use at least time n to the power of c, where c is some number that's like 1.8 or something. Now, actually, uh, we believe that any algorithm solving SAT with sublinear space needs time like 2 to the n, but you know, complexity theory is very hard. We can't prove anything, and this is already an amazing result. But on the subject of the C, I mean, the way he did it, it's very sophisticated, and the C is actually not 1.8, but it's the largest root of this polynomial, C cubed minus C squared minus 2C plus 1 equals 0. And yeah, cool theorem. So he sent me a copy of the thesis, and I was reading it, and I was like, huh. And so I had my computer calculate some more digits. And then I was like, I wonder if what happens if you plug this into inverse symbolic calculator. And you do. And it tells you, hey, it's the root of 1 plus 2x minus x squared minus x cubed. And I was like, yeah, I knew that. But if you look carefully down here, you also see that it's cos pi over 7 plus cos pi over 7. 
also known as 2 cos pi over 7. <laughs> uh, so it's somewhat sophisticated. And I was like, hey, Ryan, check it out. It's 2 cos pi over 7. And OK, once you know that, it's, you can use some elementary math to prove it. And so you know, his restated theorem looks like this. Uh, any algorithm, sublinear space algorithm for SAT, requires time n to the 2 cos pi over 7. And isn't that much cooler looking? It's pretty nice. <laughs> so that's the usage of that. Uh, in 2010, I was working on some problem in complexity theory, and somehow it turned into a problem in geometry. And I need to know the answer to this. Again, it's not important exactly what this math is, but I'll just tell it to you. I need to know if you have two sets that are closed and bounded on convex, and they have a smooth boundary, like, I don't know, like a sphere and an ellipsoid, and you take their union, does that have a piecewise smooth boundary? And it's like, I don't know. I mean, I'm not that kind of mathematician. I, I mean, but this is the kind of question, right, where like, you're like, I don't know, but I know somebody knows. <laughs> like a well-trained, I don't know, analytic geometer or something knows the answer to this. So, um, yeah, you may know this too. There's a website for that. Um, it's like a Stack Exchange, but for research math, mathoverflow.net. And I slightly hesitate to recommend this because really, you know, the etiquette here is to only ask research level questions. So you cannot just write any old thing that pops into your mind or people will get a little bit mad at you. But if you have like a you know, genuine like, question like this, where you're like, well, it's a real math question that I'm pretty sure some mathematician knows, but I'm not even sure who to ask, then you can ask here. And indeed, I asked here, and this Andreas Blast, like helpfully, I don't know, in six hours or something, I don't know, or less, uh, told me the answer, which is no, which was annoying for me, but that's life. Um, so yeah, when you're doing research, at least, do not use this for your homework, please, but when you're doing research, there's another source you can have. OK, and as you may also know, there's like stack exchanges for other topics. So there's like, there's like the low budget version of Math Overflow, where like you can ask any question you want about math, even if it's like not research level. It's like homework level, it's mathstackexchange.com. Don't post your homework there either, though. Um, and the analog for computer science, and there in computer science, it's mostly actually about TCS, which is nice, is CS Stack Exchange. CS Theory Stack Exchange is like the research analog uh, for CS Theory. Not as active, though, as mathoverflow.net. And there's also one for LaTeX, as I've mentioned before. So you can find all your LaTeX answers there as well. Great. Let me ask you another question. Uh, let's say you're doing some asymptotics, as we will be doing in the next lecture. And you're like, boy, I forget calculus class. What's the fourth order or Taylor series for arcsine x? Of course, you will solve this problem not by looking at a, a calculus text but by using like Mathematica or Maple, which is like the Canadian old-fashioned alternative to Mathematica, <laughs> or Sage, which is like the free Python-based version of these programs, but does not have as many features, unfortunately. Um, so the first two are really awesome. Uh, Mathematica and Maple, it's so great. Uh, they're not free, but if you're a CMU student, then you can get access to it freely, so please do that. And uh, you should use them all the time. Uh, they can tell you everything. If you've never used them before, I guess I may recommend Mathematica instead of Maple because it, there's a stock exchange for it and you can get your answers, questions answered much more easily. It's very hard to get questions answered about Maple. Uh, so maybe don't get started on it unless you're like an old Canadian like me that somehow got hooked on it and now that's the one they know. But they're both equally feature rich, so they're great. So, you know, if you need to know this, you just crack open the software. This is Maple. You type series arcsine x4, and it just tells you the answer. Like, there you go. Uh, or like in Wolfram Alpha, I know you all know about Wolfram Alpha. You can just type it in English, and it'll tell you the answer. And, you know, unlike maybe, you know, when you're doing your undergrad homework, and there are people like, don't do that. Like, when you're solving an open problem, you know, do whatever you can. I mean, this is all resources to help solve your problems. I mean, uh, I know serious researchers that do not, mathematics researchers that do not use Mathematica or Maple, and I think they're totally crazy. Like, I don't understand why they're intentionally like, handicapping themselves in this way. So um, basically, they can do everything. I mean, they're not going to solve your problem, but like, you know, you can answer like, you know, little conjectures you have, write code to like, find out answers to small questions, compute things. I mean, I definitely don't integrate things anymore by hand. I don't even like differentiate things by hand anymore. Uh, I don't even do arithmetic anymore, like simplifying expressions. Just type it into whatever, Mathematica or Maple. There's, there's no reason not to. And if you haven't like, started with this, 
you know, don't wait and be the next time you have like a problem like, oh, when am I going to download Mathematica and try to learn it just to solve this small problem? Just start it today and play around with it because you'll enjoy using it. Um, so in particular, like, um, basically, if you think anybody in the history of computing has ever tried to use a computer to solve some kind of math problem, then Mathematica or Maple can solve that kind of math problem. So try to do it. Uh, there's also MATLAB, by the way, which is basically in the same category, but is more like for numerical things and matrix, matrix things. Uh, you should also learn that too and use it for such things, but at least start here with Mathematica and Maple. Okay, so uh, perfect. Last segment of the talk will be have a little bit of math, and it's, I don't know, some uh, vignette to try to illustrate all of these tips about street fighting mathematics that I've just told you. Uh, so we'll try to do an example. So let's say you're doing some research and you have like a grand, you know, computational TCS problem, but like it boils down to, or a key component turns out to be this math problem. And actually, this is, I'll read it in a second, but this is like not hypothetical. This particular math problem, I like know several different papers and areas where it literally comes up, like an analysis of Boolean functions, quantum query complexity. This is the sort of thing that like may come up in your TCS research. Let me read it. Uh, imagine you have a polynomial and you know it has degree, a one variable polynomial, and it has degree at most n. And it has some constraints on it. You know that for every input to the polynomial between minus one and one, real numbers between minus one and one, the polynomial outputs some number between minus one and one. Okay? And the question is, how large could the derivative at zero be? Uh, so if you want to think of a picture, right, like imagine like good old in high school, like the, the xy plane and like a box going from minus one, one on the x-axis and minus one and one on the y-axis and your polynomial is inside that box in the sense that minus one and one inputs, it's between minus one and one. And what is the derivative at zero? It's the slope at zero. So you can imagine like, you know, a little old cubic polynomial and it looks like this or something or a quadratic polynomial looks like this or a quartic polynomial looks like this. If it has to stay inside that box, it cannot probably have like a slope at the origin that's like a billion, right? Because, I don't know, it would probably shoot out of the box in that case. Um, so probably there's some bound, and it probably depends on n. And this is the sort of thing that can come up. And you may need to know the answer to this, and how can you find out the answer to this? Because there's not really like a class, like an obvious class maybe that teaches you, like a math class even, that teaches you how to solve this problem. If you're very good at Google, you can possibly solve this one by Googling. Because it's like elementary enough, it's sort of well known enough that you maybe do it, can do it if you're really good at Google. It's tough because, you know, Googling math is not so easy. Like, how do you, what would you type into Google for this? But if you're real good at it, you can take it as a challenge. You might be able to do it. Um, but instead of doing that, uh, well, you could also ask it on, if it came down to this and you're like, okay, I just really need to know this, you could ask it on like Math Stack Exchange if you put a little effort into it yourself. Um, but let's try to solve it using street fighting mathematics. Well, I'm sure you got this advice before. If you ever have any problem that involves like a number n, you should just try like n equals 1 and n equals 2 and n equals 3 and try to get a sense of the problem. So let's do that. Let's try n equals 3. n is the bound on the polynomial's degree. So let's imagine we only cared about n equals 3. So now we're asking, let's say you have a a cubic polynomial, like a plus bx plus cx squared plus dx cubed. And it has this constraint that, you know, if you plug in numbers between minus 1 and 1, it outputs numbers that are between minus 1 and 1. So, you know, for every real number between minus 1 and 1, like x equals 0.2, you have actually, well, two linear inequality constraints, right? This is the polynomial with 0.2 plugged in, and you know it's supposed to be at most 1 and at least minus 1. So you have, uh, well, infinitely many constraints like this on A, B, C, and D, right? One for every real number between minus one and one. And you're curious how big the derivative at zero can be. What is the derivative at zero of this polynomial? It's B. Yeah, if you differentiate and plug in x equals zero, you get B. Uh, so in some sense, we want to maximize, it's like A, B, C, and D are like real parameters. We want to maximize B subject to all these constraints. We don't know how big could B could be. 
And now it's you know one place where you can get started with uh, you know street fighting mathematics. I mean, like a very hardcore pure mathematician would be like, oh, I have continuum many constraints and it's an infinitary problem. But come on, like let's be friends here and try to keep things finite. Uh, for example, you might say to yourself, probably this problem does not change much if instead of having this constraint for every real number between minus one and one, I just had it for like I don't know five thousand values, like a grid of values or like five thousand random values between minus one and one. That's, pro that's probably not going to make much of a difference. So let's, let's simplify our lives a little bit that way. And so then if let's say you pick 5,000 numbers, real numbers, x between minus 1 and 1, and you plug them into the polynomial, you get two inequalities for each one. So you would have 10,000 linear inequalities involving these four variables, a, b, c, and d, constraining them. And you're wondering how big b can be. And Actually, if you know uh, some TCS, you may know that what we really have here is a linear program. So, uh, but otherwise, let's actually just imagine for visualization's sake that you just had three variables, a, b, and c. So every linear equation like a plus 0.2b plus 0.04c is less than or equal to 1. The set of a, b, and c that satisfy that is some half space. And if you have a bunch of half spaces, the set of points A, B, C that satisfy all of them is like the intersection of them. So the intersection makes some kind of you know, like flat-sided shape here called a polytope. I've drawn a picture in three dimensions with like an A axis and a B axis and a C axis. Actually, our problem has four variables, but you cannot draw four dimensions. So let's just imagine this picture. So it'll have like 10,000 sides, this shape. And you're wondering like what pair, or sorry, what point A, B, C, D has the biggest value in the B axis. So if this is the b direction here, then you're like, you're wondering, what is this point and what is its b value? Does that make sense? Um, so, so I said this is like an optimization problem. It's a particular kind called the linear program, which maybe you've seen before, hopefully, or if not, we're going to study it in this course a little bit. Uh, but you know, it's maximizing some variable or linear function uh, subject to some linear inequalities. And you can get a computer to solve that. So let's do it. Uh, as I said, I use Maple. So uh, here's the Maple code I wrote to do this. You don't have to know exactly how it works, but just super briefly here, I like load some packages. I'm telling it, okay, we're going to do degree three. I'm going to pick 5,000 points. This is defining the polynomial with four coefficients. Instead of calling them A, B, C, D, I called them C0, C1, C2, C3, because we're going to have a general degree here. I generate 5,000 random points between minus 1 and 1. I get the 10,000 constraints. And then here I tell it to solve this optimization problem. So maximize the second coefficient, c1. I was calling it b on the other slide, but c1, subject to these constraints. And then find out what is like the best, the largest derivative at 0, the largest b value, and what is the polynomial that achieves it. And then also plot it for me. Okay, So if you run this code, for d equals three, degree 3, n equals 3. I don't know if you can see it, but I'll read it out loud. It does this. It finds some answer for the best degree, and it plots the polynomial. You can see, I think, that it indeed looks like it's between minus 1 and 1, on inputs between minus 1 and 1. And if you look at what it finds, the biggest possible value for b, that derivative at 0, that slope right here, it's 3.0005. So you're like, probably that's 3, right? <laughs> I mean, if you think about it right, you didn't constrain the polynomial to be between minus 1 and 1 literally everywhere. You just did it on 5,000 points. So maybe it's actually going a teeny bit above 1 and minus 1 here. So if you really constrained it everywhere, then probably you know, we would shave that 3.05 down to 3, probably. Right? Probably. So it looks like the maximizer, uh, when the degree is 3, is this polynomial. In fact, if you squint at the coefficients, this is actually basically 0, this is basically 0, this is basically 3, this is basically minus 4. It looks like it's 3x minus 4x cubed. And then you're like, OK, I can try to prove by hand that this indeed at least is between minus 1 and 1 on inputs between minus 1 and 1. Hopefully you can do that. And yeah, it looks like the answer is 3. So that's good. We made some progress. And since we wrote some nice code and we did it properly without like three being hard coded in and we used the variable, we can just change this one line here. Uh, it's no longer showing, but anyway, this one line here where the degree is three and we can set it to anything. So we can try one, two, three, four, five, six. So let's do that. This is one. Um, 
Makes sense. It pretty much looks like the best solution is p of x equals x, which has the derivative 1 at 0. OK, here's the solution for degree equals 2. This looks a little weird. Um, looks like it's half plus 1x minus 0.5x squared. Anyway, the maximum slope here is 1. OK, 3 we did. The maximum slope is 3. Now, if you do degree equals 4, actually something interesting happens. Uh, the best thing seems to be the exact same polynomial. 3x minus 4x cubed, which is funny. You're like, oh, you were allowed to be degree 4. And it was like, that's fine. I'm just going to be degree 3 anyway. It's possible. OK. And so if you ask, uh, what about degree equals 5, then actually it gets a bigger slope. It gets 5. And this is the polynomial, seemingly. Degree 6, same polynomial again. Interesting. And now you've halfway solved the problem. Because uh, basically, here's the summary of what you found. Um, well, there's some weird anomaly at degree 2, but a couple of things. First of all, when the degree was even, it looked like the optimizer was just the same optimizer for like, the odd number that was one number less. In fact, actually, you could try to prove that um, for fun. But anyway, you don't have to. Uh, so it looks like you might focus just on the odd degrees now. And it looked like you know, when the degree was like 1, 3, 5, the answer for the, the biggest derivative of 0 was like 1, 3, 5. And in fact, um, in some sense, if this is part of a larger research program, like you're in great shape right now. Because probably you wanted to know the answer to this question. And it was probably because you probably, I don't know, wanted it to be small. Uh, and maybe you really wanted it to be, at most, like square root n or something, because then you'd be able to solve the problem this way. And now you're like, well, it's probably not square root n. It looks like, I don't know, it looks like pretty much the largest coefficient for degree n is n. So I don't have to worry about this problem anymore. I mean, there's no point in like probably going further, right? This is very convincing. Um, on the other hand, if like, you know, it's OK for your global problem, you know, for it to be n or order n or something, then you're super excited. You're like, oh, I'm almost done. I just have to somehow prove this thing, and then my problem is solved, right? So, I mean, you can make progress in your research without like being like, oh, now I have to spend two weeks trying to mathematically solve this problem exactly as if it were a homework problem. So let's say actually it was good for you if like, you know, if, if, if this is true that the maximum is when n is odd, it's n, or if it's like the one less number if n is even, then OK, you could try to prove it. Well, now what would you do? Well, any suggestion? All of these coefficients are integers. Yes? Oh, that's true. They have to do with the, the uh, Kytrus, they have to do with the expression for trigonometric functions in terms of multiple angles. True. But let's say you were not so sophisticated. That, I mean, if you know that, then you're like, oh, problem solved. And that is true. But you could also, yeah, what was your name? Danny. Danny. Yeah, you could also try that. This might not work, but you could try it. Just type these coefficients, like 1, 3, negative 4, 5, 20, 16 into OEIS. And actually, it does work. It works. Um, yeah, if you type them in, then you're like, bingo. And you're like, oh, it's the triangle of coefficients of the Chebyshev polynomials, t sub 2n plus 1 x. And then you're like, what are the Chebyshev polynomials? Well, of course, <laughs> you go to Wikipedia and you like, start reading. And you're like, oh, they're extremal polynomials for many other properties. And there's like a little citation, too. And you're like, oh, two. It's this book, The Chebyshev Polynomials, by Theodore Rivlin, published in 1974. And you can see, like, OK, you can get the solution out of this book. You can see how, right, like, you would never get to this book in like, some other way, right? Like, how would you ever find this without you know, beating the system a little bit, right? If you like, wandered into like, the library, well, there's no books in the library anymore, but <laughs> hypothetically, if you wandered into the library and you're like, maybe there's a math book that can help me here, it would be a million years before you found this book. Okay? So then you have to like, look at this book. As you said, there's no books in the library, so you have to find some sort of alternate computer-based way of looking at this book. I guess one legal way is to like, uh, use maybe a little search inside and like books.google.com. Anyway, long story short, uh, 
This bit on page like 108, this theorem 2.20 here, if you decipher it, it literally proves the thing that you would conjecture. Okay, and as I said, like then you write the paper and a proposition and you're just like, we need the following well-known fact which appears in this book by Rivlin. <laughs> uh, yeah, and it's no joke, like that's how it'll go. Um, and I bring this all up because, you know, oftentimes you're like reading a paper like this and you're like so discouraged, you're like, this is not a well-known fact to me. How did I ever know this book? Like, who ever knew this? But yeah, not everybody knows all these facts. Almost nobody knows any of these facts, right? But, you know, <laughs> research grinds slowly, and this is how you learn these things. Um, yeah, so that's it. That's the end of my little anecdote about street fighting math. And actually, the end of all, I guess, all my stories about TCS. So I will just uh, end with this slide reminding you of some things. And you can find this slide on Twitter and stuff, too. Um, but I scolded you a little and told you to do some things today to get started, you know, go to Diderot, set up your LaTeX workflow, set up all your LaTeX files, get your presentation software, blah, blah, blah. Here are all the websites I mentioned that you can go to. And that's it. So on Thursday, I'll see you and we'll write some math on the board. <laughs>